to cry my chat or no I'm not. Once again, to our online worship from Cromer Church. Really, really good to have you uh, joining with us. Uh, if you've got a Bible with you, why don't you open with me to uh, Revelation chapter 4. Uh, we're going to be looking at it together over the next few moments. Uh, Revelation chapter 4. John writes, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice that I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Uh, Once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the centre around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. 
Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. The twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our lords and gods, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we pray as we come to have a look at it together? Uh, as John was on, was in the spirits that Sunday morning, he was given this magnificent vision as heaven opened. And Lord God, we pray that by that same spirit that inspired your apostle John, uh, so you would show us wonderful things. Uh, encourage us, strengthen us, and challenge us, we pray. Uh, for Jesus' sake we ask. Amen. Uh, I don't know how you uh, spent the bank holiday uh, week and last uh, week. Uh, I did something uh, that I do very, very infrequently. Uh, I watched a film. It's not that I have anything particularly against films. I just never seem to have the time to uh, watch them. Uh, the film I watched uh, was the film Darkest Hour, starring uh, Gary Oldman as Winston Churchill. Uh, You might have seen it. It focuses on the dark and difficult early days of Churchill's premiership, Uh, the days as uh, the Nazi blitzkrieg was sweeping across Europe and uh, threatening uh, to overrun uh, Britain. Uh, Much of the film is told from the perspective of Churchill's secretary. Uh, There's a key scene uh, where she's taken down to the nerve centre of operations, uh, the uh, cabinet war rooms uh, in the heart of Whitehall. Uh, At first uh, glance, it wasn't a place that was particularly immediately obvious as anywhere special. Uh, It's not much to look at, they just access it through uh, through a a, a grubby uh, entrance. In fact, at the time the film was set, very few people even knew that it existed. But it was from this stuffy, grubby bunker uh, that decisions were made that would shape the the course of history. Uh, Decisions whose ramifications even echo down uh, to our own uh, day to day. Uh, Verse 1 of our reading, John says, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Uh, John is summoned, if you like, into the control room uh, at Supreme Headquarters. Uh, He's given a glimpse in this passage behind the scenes of all that exists and, and all that happens. He gets to peer into the very heart of eternity uh, itself. Uh, What a vision. Well, what did he uh, see? Well, let's uh, have a look with him at uh, what he saw when uh, heaven was opened. And the first thing we're told he saw uh, was he had a vision of God's power. He had a vision of God's power. Uh, The composer George Frederick Handel was once asked how he came to write his magnificent work, The Messiah. And he said, uh, I saw the heavens opened, and God was on his great white throne. Well, I don't know if that was uh, quite true. Uh, But John certainly uh, tells us that as he looked into heaven, there before me was a throne with someone sitting on it. Uh, Like Handel, like the prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel who went before him, uh, John is given a glimpse here of the awesome power and majesty of God. Uh, To describe in any detail what he saw is beyond language. He just can't do it. Language doesn't exist uh, to describe what he saw. Uh, So rather, what he does instead is he gives us a sort of general sense, a general impression of the splendor uh, that surrounds God. Uh, It's so rich in detail, isn't it? Verse 3, he tells us, The one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Uh, Verse 5 goes on, from the throne came flashes of lightning, uh, rumblings and peals of thunder. John is hearing uh, echoes of of God's self-disclosure from earlier on in in the Bible storyline. When God gave the law to his people at uh, Mount Sinai, when he gave them the Ten Commandments, uh, the stone tablets were delivered amid uh, flashes of lightning and rumbles of thunder. Uh, the rainbow that uh, John saw uh, around the, uh, the throne 
uh, reminds us of the God's promise to, to Noah right at the very start of the Bible, that he would never flood the earth again, uh, that he would remain uh, true uh, to his promises. Uh, that John sees God on the throne uh, in his awesome power and his majesty. Uh, John sees God uh, on the throne. Uh, but he tells us this throne itself isn't alone. It's surrounded, uh, he tells us, by other thrones. Uh, God is a power, a God of power. And this power puts him at the centre of uh, the cosmos, of the, the universe. Uh, everything else gets pushed, if you like, uh, to the edges. Uh, he is the one at the centre. And seated, uh, there are other thrones around him. And, and seated on them were the 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold. Uh, they are on the edges. They surround uh, God uh, himself. It's a reminder for us, isn't it, that even the things or the people that seem powerful are puny when they're compared to the power of the Lord on his throne. Well, that's a reminder, isn't it, that we need at the moment. We need it at all times, but perhaps especially at the moment in which we find ourselves uh, today. Uh, at the moment, it feels as though everything is being forced uh, to bow before uh, King Covid, if you like. And maybe it's significant that uh, the name coronavirus literally uh, means crown virus. It gets its name from the shape of the, uh, the virus. Uh, but it's a good description, isn't it? In so many ways, it feels like life is having to bow down uh, before uh, some kind of god or some kind of king. Now, to be sure, coronavirus is powerful, isn't it? Uh, it's not only wiped out our diaries uh, and put a stop to our activities, uh, it's bringing even nations and, and economies crashing down and being forced to acknowledge it and to, uh, to bow before it. But John's vision is a vision that we desperately need to be hearing this morning. Because it's a vision that reminds us that however powerful COVID might be, or however powerful anyone else might seem, they're not the ultimate power. That power belongs to to God. He is in his place, and that place is at the centre of the universe, controlling everything else that happens. He is on the throne, and everything bows to his whim. He is still at work, even in days like today, working out his purposes, even when everything else seems to be saying the contrary. He is the powerful one, the mighty one, and everything and everyone must bow to him. John sees God's power, and as his vision expands, it only serves, I think, to reinforce what he's already seen. Uh, because the second thing that he sees is not just God's power, but he sees the praise uh, that God deserves as well, the praise that God deserves. John tells us that at the centre of this uh, scene that he saw uh, is uh, the throne. Uh, but around the throne, John tells us, verse 6, uh, there were four living creatures. Uh, one, he tells us, was like a lion. Uh, one was like an ox. Uh, the third was uh, like a man. And the fourth one uh, was like a flying eagle. Uh, there have been lots of speculation over the years about what these people are. Sometimes they've been thought to represent the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I think the answer, very, very simply, the best answer is to say that it represents creation. It's a reminder that from every corner of the earth, even creation itself sings the praise of the one who is on the throne. Again, that's something we know uh, when we read back into the Old Testament. Uh, the Psalms often picture creation as existing for God's praise. Remember the words of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Uh, when we see the beauty of a sunset sky, when we see the majesty of a, of a prowling uh, lion patrolling through the Serengeti, uh, all of it comes together, it combines to reflect the glory of the one who created it. That creation praises God. And John says in particular, their praise centers on three uh, different but vital aspects of God's uh, nature and his person. Uh, firstly, we're told that nature creation praises God uh, for his purity. Uh, their cry, verse 8, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Uh, to be holy is to be free from sin, but it's also at the root of its meaning, means to be set apart. Uh, God is not like you or me. Uh, yes, we're made in his image, 
Uh, but he's not just like one of us. He's not sort of some kind of uh, superhuman being. No, he's other. He stands apart. He is holy, uh, perfect, uh, magnificent, brilliant in his uh, purity. Uh, he is other. He is holy, and they praise him. Praise him for his holiness. Secondly, they praise him, we're told, uh, because he is mighty. At verse 11, they say, uh, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. Uh, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Uh, God is mighty. Uh, sometimes people think that the world is a little bit like a, a clock. It's like, perhaps like Cromer Church uh, clock in the tower. Uh, it gets wound up and it's just left to kind of carry on and do its business on its own. Uh, but that's not how the world works. The Bible testifies that not only did God start the world, but he sustains it as well. And he sustains it by his mighty power. He keeps it going. Every breath that we take, uh, every moment uh, that we exist, is sustained by the Lord God in his almighty power. He is praised because he's mighty. Uh, thirdly and lastly, creation praises God uh, for his eternity. His eternity, his everlastingness, if you like. He is the one, they say, who was and is and is to come. Empires rise, empires fall, kings come, kings go. But the Lord our God is the one who endures forever. He is the same yesterday, today and forever and he does not change. Truly, he alone is worthy to receive glory and honour. He is worthy of our praise. One of the most uh, influential documents in Western church history is the famous Westminster Shorter Catechism. It was a document produced in the 17th century to ground people at the time in uh, Bible truth that had been discover rediscovered uh, at the Reformation. Uh, its opening question famously asks this. It says, what is the chief end of man? Or put it another way, why do we exist? What are we here for? Uh, what's the purpose of life? And the answer comes back to glorify God and enjoy him forever. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Uh, ultimately, the reason why you exist, the reason why I exist, the reason why we are put on this earth is to worship God, to glorify him. Uh, what is worship? Well, uh, literally, uh, our word worship comes from an Anglo-Saxon word, which means to attribute worth to someone. It is to give someone the honour and the glory that is due to their name. Uh, we might say that worship is really worthship. Uh, when we're worshipping God, we are giving him the worth or ascribing him the worth that he alone deserves. And that, says the Bible, is what we are put here to do. Uh, you might be watching this video and you might be thinking, well, I'm not a Christian, that's fine for you. I'm not here to worship. I don't worship. My life doesn't consist of worshipping anything. Well, a wise man once made the observation that we don't get a choice. <laughs> Everybody worships something. Uh, some of us choose to worship God. Some of us choose to worship our careers. Uh, some of us choose to worship uh, technology uh, or uh, our, uh, our, our house. But the only choice we do get is what it is that we worship. And John's vision here, I think, reminds us that really, when you strip it all away, there's only one thing in this world that actually is worthy of our worship. And that is God. Because whether in good times or in bad, however we're feeling, whether we're feeling great or whether we're feeling down, uh, he alone is the mighty one. Uh, he alone is the one who deserves our praise. So this morning, let each of us enthrone him and choose to enthrone him at the centre of our lives. And in the words of a hymn, cast our crowns before him, lost in wonder, love and praise. He alone is worthy. Creation says, day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Let's this morning make heaven's cry our cry and worship with heaven, the one who is at the centre of all things, the one who is upon the throne, our Lord, our God. Amen. We stand and lift up.
who is holy, almighty and everlasting and will be coming before him in prayer. During our time together there will be an opportunity for you to join in with a response. So when I say the words Lord in your mercy please respond, hear our prayer. Let's pray. And Father we begin our prayers by acknowledging that you Lord are indeed worthy of our praise. Father, we thank you and praise you for this glimpse we've been given this morning of your throne room in heaven and what it will be like for us if we remain steadfast in our faith and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ to the end of our earthly lives. That picture of eternal praise and worship as we give him all the glory, honour and power he so rightly deserves. We pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us as individuals, as a church, as a nation, and as your world at this time. We ask for a fresh anointing of your Spirit's power on each one of us, that we may be filled and refilled, to enable us to fulfil the plans and purposes you have for us, your co-workers, in helping bring your kingdom fully in. And as we look forward to the time when Jesus will return to live among us once more, Give us joy in our love of the Lord Jesus, joy that overflows and touches those around us, our families, friends and neighbours, 
joy that makes those who don't yet know you wonder what it is about us that is different. Joy that others want to find out more about how they too can experience it. Joy that brings forward the time when at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sovereign Lord, we continue to pray for our leaders, both locally and nationally, whether they be church leaders, elected representatives or government officials. We ask you to give them your supernatural wisdom as they process what must be a mass of additional medical and scientific information on top of their usual roles and responsibilities and as they make what could be life and death decisions for us individually and as a nation. May each decision be made in the best interests of the people they serve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, we pray for our frontline and key workers who are working tirelessly and selflessly to keep us safe and to provide us with our basic needs. We thank you especially for those working in hospitals, care homes, social carers and for our funeral directors, all of whom are potentially putting themselves at risk every day. Give them the courage, strength and energy they need for each day and in each situation they face and protect them from all harm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And loving Lord, we bring before you all who are struggling in any way at this time. We pray you would give them a knowledge of your presence and your peace in their hearts. Bring comfort and healing to those who need to feel your Spirit's healing touch in their lives. Today we pray particularly for two members of our own church family. Peter Gerald, who was due to have an operation for a pacemaker on Friday that's just gone, and Jean Stewart, who is currently out of hospital but waiting for an operation which is due to take place later this month. I'm sure there are many others that I'm unaware of but who are on our hearts, and God knows them all. So let's have a moment of silence as we lift them to the Lord now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let's conclude our time of prayer together by joining uh, with the words of the prayer that Jesus himself taught us as we pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us uh, this Sunday morning to worship. It's been great to uh, have you sharing in our worship with us. Uh, can I remind you that straight after uh, our time together on YouTube, uh, we are having an uh, online coffee uh, via Zoom. If you want to join us, uh, then the details were published in the weekly update uh, or they're published uh, in the comments section uh, below this video. Uh, if you type them into Zoom, you can uh, come through to join us for virtual coffee. Uh, we meet this week uh, at uh, 9.30 on our Facebook page every uh, weekday morning for morning prayer. Uh, and this week, our uh, online virtual worship from uh, YouTube is moving to Thursday rather than Wednesday. Uh, same time, 10.30 uh, to mark Ascension Day. I uh, hope that you can join us then. But whatever you're doing this week, uh, may you live in praise and glory uh, to the one uh, who is seated on the throne. Uh, let's close by saying the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.